Welcome to another instructional session regarding the practices and procedures of applied behavior analysis. In part two of our series on behavioral recording, we address a couple of behavior recording procedures. Frequency recording, sometimes known as event recording, that's used for assessing short-lived actions, and we'll also take a look at duration recording that's conducted when we have longer lasting variable length. After having viewed part one of this series, I'm certain that you can recall the six dimensions of behavior that can be assessed. They're on the tip of your tongue and you follow along with me and say, oh yes, frequency, that has to do with the number of times that the action occurs. Perhaps we've decided to assess the duration of the behavior, the length of time that it is happening. We'll remember latency as being the length of time that transpires between a stimulus and finally the response, the action being shown. We might assess the magnitude, the force, or the power behind a behavior. We could also decide to evaluate the locus, the where, or the on the body or in the environment. We might also assess topography, how close the action comes to a model that we have in mind, the shape, the form of the behavior. There have been a number of recording procedures that have been developed to assess the various dimensions of behavior. But how do we know when to use a particular recording procedure? Here's the flow chart. If we're concerned about how many times the behavior is happening, the numerical dimension, well, then we've got to decide when we see the behavior, is it a quickly happening one? Or is it one that sometimes is rather brief and other times could go on for a while? Well, if it's typically a short burst of behavior, we're going to use frequency recording or event recording. If we have a mix of brief and longer lasting behaviors, then we're going to engage in uh, interval recording if that behavior happens with a high frequency, or we'll use time sampling if it's happening at a moderate rate. We'll get into interval recording and time sampling in part three of this video series. If the behavior has us more concerned about the length of time involved, whether it's prior to the response, remember that latency aspect, that latency dimension, the time that transpires between the stimulus and the response, or we'll use duration recording if we're concerned about once the behavior does begin, it lasts for quite a while. There we're going to use duration recording, and we will now look at these procedures in a more in-depth manner. As we stated earlier, frequency recording is used for short-lived behaviors. But at which temporal point does an action transition from being brief to being extended? The cutoff point is determined by you. I like to use a 10 second or less guideline for the most part. But when you think of behaviors that happen quickly and then cease until the next display, what are some that come to mind? One of those guttural expulsions, swearing, pinching, poking, punching, yelling out the answer without having been recognized and called upon, or asking to borrow a pencil. What we do is we make a tally mark to keep track of how many times the behavior has happened during the time period that we're watching. Then we compute, figure out the average number of times that the action happens per some human designated time period 
What does that mean? Well, it's how we humans divide up the passage of time. Einstein informed us that time is actually variable and relative. <laughs> You've experienced that in a one-hour class that can pass quickly sometimes and seem like an eternity other times. It's all relative. But we humans do break it up into certain intervals, minute, hour, class period per day. So we're going to look at our tally marks, divide it by the, uh, the number of time periods that we have been observing. Here's uh, an example of a tally sheet, a recording form that might be used to collect data with our frequency count. You'll see that we're also making note of environmental factors that might be influencing the actions that we're recording. What might account for the difference in off-topic comments between the two observations? Hmm. This person who's observing thinks that it might well be that the student teacher in the first observation was lecturing a great deal while the cooperating teacher was present during the second observation and engaged the students in more activities. All right, how do we make sense of the data that we collected? Well, we set up a ratio of the number of times we observe that action to the number of time periods. Perhaps we're using minutes, maybe we're using class periods, maybe we're using hours, whichever one seems to make the most sense. We then use the largest common denominator, that largest number that will divide into each number in the ratio. Let's look at an example here. During the school week, Jane was sent to the office five times. All right. So let's see, in X1, the number of times that we saw the action being sent to the office, that's what we're monitoring. Gee, five times, so we're going to X1 will be five. Now X2, during the school week, all right, I guess we're going to put a one there where X2 is, and we'll have a ratio of five to one. We choose answer number four, five times per week. However, we could also look at days where how many times do we see the behavior? Well, we saw it five times. X2, gee, there are five days in a school week, five to five. We choose the largest common denominator. What number divides uh, into both? Gee, five. We get a one-to-one -one ratio. In that case, we would have selected answer number three once per day. Let's give it a try. You witness the demonstration of a target behavior, whichever one you've defined specifically in observable and measurable terms. You observe that 12 times during a 48 minute class period. Pause the podcast right now, create your ratio, use your largest common denominator, and then restart the video. Let's see, we're gonna have 12 times to 48 minutes, 12 to 48. And we can divide 12 into each number in the ratio, reducing it to one time to four minutes, one to four. Yes, this behavior is happening on the average once every four minutes. Here's your homework assignment. Go to the videos section of BehaviorAdvisor.com and view the video with Joe. While we are recording his behavior, this video will give us experience with frequency recording. Pretend that the video is exactly two minutes long, that's your observation period, and make a tally mark each time the instructor utters one of these two sounds, uh or um. 
you'll find that certain things make it difficult for you to get an accurate count. Which happenings and definitional issues occur during your observation that make it more difficult to attend to your task? PPR, Permanent Product Recording, is a form of frequency recording in which we count the number of items produced by the student. They're not truly permanent, but they are the remains of an action. For example, you could count homework assignments submitted during the week. The number of meaningful marks made during a 15-minute task. By that statement, I mean the total amount of numbers and operational signs on a math sheet, or maybe words in an essay, or number of adjectives in a hundred word excerpt from an essay. Maybe it's the number of chairs tipped over in an angry outburst, the number of pencils broken during the day, uh, perhaps the number of origami swans made during a half hour construction period, and so on. With duration recording, we're typically using a timer, a stopwatch. And whenever we see the behavior that we've defined in observable and measurable terms, we see it pop up, we start the watch. And then we stop the watch when it ceases. At the end of our observation, we can compute the average length of time that the behavior occurred. Or, we could do it slightly differently and get the percentage of the observation time that the behavior was occurring. Now, I was watching a swim meet, see my little note to myself down there at the bottom, and for many young children, it was their first swim meet. The coaches just wanted to involve them and expose them to competition. Yes, the stopwatch was being used to time the swim, but I noticed that the young flounderers were not swimming as we think of it during the entire race. They will certainly benefit from working on the topography dimension in the future, progressing toward proper swimming form. Now, when the start tone sounded, it took about five seconds for one aqua boy to get up enough nerve to belly flop into the water. He then held on to the lane divider a couple of times in order to catch his breath. I didn't have my personal stopwatch running when he was swimming, but I could have turned it on when he was swimming and turned it off when he wasn't. And then I could compare my accumulated time of actual swimming to the official timer's results for this boy's race. I'd be able to determine the percent of time during the race that the youngster was actually swimming if that was the behavior that I had defined. I'm guessing that he would have actually been swimming maybe 80% of the, uh, the total time of leaping off the starting blocks to touching the wall at the other end of the pool. Let's look at the formula for making sense of our observations. What we're going to do is place the total time that the behavior was happening and then divide it by the total time of our observation period. Let's take a look here and you make use of that formula. So we're observing for 20 minutes and as we look at our stopwatch, the accumulated time, we see that, gee, you know, when I started the stopwatch and it was, it was recording the time, when the behavior happened, then I would click off the stopwatch when the behavior ceased, but oh, there it goes again, and I would start the stopwatch again. We see that the total accumulated time, the amount of time that the behavior was happening during that 20 minutes, was 15 minutes. Oh, we were also keeping track of how many displays of the behavior there were. There were five of them. Let's calculate the percentage of the block of time, the observation period that it occurred. You see block of time pictorially represented there. And also, what was the average length of each episode? 
Pause the podcast at this point to engage in your calculations. All right, we observe for 20 minutes. The behavior was happening for 15 of those minutes. We're going to place the 15 minutes of accumulated time over the 20 minute observation period, reduce that fraction to three quarters, and yes, possible answer number one is the one we'd like to select as we convert that three quarters into percentage, 75% of the time. And yes, five one four, we have a problem with fractions. Hmm, wonder if that's really a ratio joke. Oh, and how, when the behavior did happen, how long did it last on the average? Hmm, let's see. The behavior happened for a total of 15 minutes. We saw it five times. We divide five into 15. We get three. Three what? Oh, yeah, the behavior tends to last three minutes on the average. Well, that concludes our session on frequency and duration recording. Thank you for joining me for this second installment of our behavior recording video series. Please join me for part three, when we'll look at interval recording and time sampling data collection procedures.